A very good evening to one and all. I welcome all the participants for the third day of our international webinar on contemporary issues in commerce and management. Today, we will be having two sessions. The first session will be by Mr. A.S. Venkatesh, who is from Chennai, and he will be talking on post-COVID-19 market scenario in India. And the second speaker of the day will be Mr. M.R. Vikram, who will be talking on foreign direct investment in India issues. I now request Assistant Professor Arshia Khanum from Department of BBA to introduce the first speaker of the evening. It's my immense pleasure to introduce the speaker for today. Mr. A.S. Venkatesh is an engineering graduate from the prestigious IIT Madras and has post graduation in business administration from IIM Ahmedabad. Academic excellence has been a feature right through his student days. He is a national talent search scholar. He entered the business of civil construction at the age of 23 and is currently managing director, Messrs. Popular Foundation Private Limited, employing over 1,400 people. He is a socially conscious person and is keenly interested in education of the girl child and empowerment of women. He is associated with many organizations in this field. He has been an active member of Roundtable India and an active Rotarian. He has been the district governor of Rotary International District as, and will be the director of Rotary International 2001-2023. He enjoys traveling, reading, and he's an avid bridge player. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you for those uh, generous words of introduction and uh, good evening and namaskar to all the delegates. Uh, since virtually uh, I'm not able to see who all are there, I presume a lot of them are there and uh, good evening to every one of you. Uh, first, let me uh, thank you for the opportunity given to me to address this uh, August gathering. Uh, my thanks uh, specifically to uh, Sunil Dizoza and my good friend, uh, your past alumni of your college, uh, Joseph Matthew. And it's really a privilege. I did check up on this institute, and it's really a privilege to have been invited to an institute like this, the kind of uh, college of excellence that this is. Uh, before I proceed, I want to know do I have screen sharing rights? Um, can I? Uh, can you uh, can you make me a co-host uh, to have screen sharing rights? Uh, okay, okay. Uh, share screen. Let's give me a minute. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, uh, so I've been given a very interesting uh, topic to address uh, all of you this uh, evening, the post COVID market scenario in India. <clears throat> I don't think anybody is in doubt about uh, whether things are going to have changed over the last six months or not. I think everybody agrees on one fact that uh, things are not the same. Whatever was normal is not normal anymore. And now we are facing a a new normal. But having said that, it's also uh, an undeniable fact that human race has been a survivor. As a race, we have been, we have survived several issues over the last hundreds of years and have still continued to survive. So whatever will be the scenario, we are a race of uh, survivors and it's only a question of adapting to the new normal. As I said earlier, things are different, but it will be the new normal as we uh, go ahead as we go forward. So before we uh, look at the post-COVID market scenario in India, let's quickly look at what Indian economy is all about. There are two different components. The service sector contributes more than 60% of the GDP, but that is not the biggest employer in the country. The biggest employer continues to be agriculture. Though the contribution of the service sector to the uh, GDP is over 60%, the biggest employer today is agriculture. 
So when you are talking about the impact of whatever, let's say COVID-19 or any other issue that uh, confronts India as a nation, we need to look at two different components. One is the impact on the GDP, second is the impact on the employment. So today, let me look at more about the uh, GDP and the business component rather than the employment component. But uh, suffice to say that the policies that are uh, the governments would take would also factor in the second factor, which is the employment. So it's not just about GDP alone when the policies are made, uh, it is also about employment. So, but today let's uh, focus essentially on the GDP and as several of us are aware and we have been reading about uh, almost on a daily basis that the economy has shrunk, there has been a dip in GDP, uh, you know, people are losing jobs and all kinds of things we read about. And this is uh, uh, no news to you when I show a graph like this that the GDP growth going down and uh, some reports said the uh, last quarter went down by almost 23%. So what does this mean? Which means the entire economy has shrunk over the last six months, but it's not going to stay this way. It is going to find a different equilibrium as we move forward, but as temporarily in the short term, yes, there is a shrinkage of the economy which throws a different set of challenges when we talk about businesses and the markets that we service. When we talk about business, essentially I want to classify, of course, you can, you have your, you may have a different methods of uh, classifying the businesses, but I want to look at two kinds of businesses. One is of course B2B, the second is uh, B2Z, uh, B2C, which is business to customer, consumers. Sir. Each of these types of businesses calls for a different set of strategies because you are getting to a different market segment, different kind of profile of a market segment. So it calls for a different set of strategies. So in these change scenario, these change circumstances, what are the options open to various businesses? Of course, the one option which is shut shop. When I don't know what's going to happen, I can't sell anything. I'm not, I don't know how to survive in business. We don't have the money, we don't have the buyers, we don't have the products or whatever else be the reason. One option is to shut shop. The second option, and let me come to the second option later. The third option is to get aggressive. When the chips are down, put more money into your uh, promotion, more money into your product development, more asset building and get aggressive, hoping that when the uh, tide turns, when the situation improves, you are in a better position to uh, capitalize on the new, uh, new uh, scenario, new situation. That is the third type. But in between these two types of businesses is the major is where the majority of the business would fall, which is wait and watch. I cannot shut shop because we have invested enough and more of our time and resources and skills and uh, talents in this business, and I can't afford to get aggressive because I don't know what is that, what lies ahead. So wait and watch, let me kind of maintain status quo, let me do a little bit here and there and continue doing whatever we can right now and hope the situation improves in some in some time, uh, in a few months or sometime in the future and then we can get back to normalcy. So this is where the majority of the businesses fall, that is wait and watch mode. Uh, there are very few which will shut shop because of various reasons, yes they do. Some of the businesses have closed down over the last six months. Uh, there are very few will also get aggressive but a majority of them would fall under uh, this uh, category. And what decision a particular business takes depends on their staying power. First of all, that's the main biggest criterion. How, how, what is the staying power? What is the ability to hold on and hang on and wait? And the kind of faith they have in the product or service. These two factors determine where each business would fall. So if a, a particular business is very sure about the product or service and are very confident that the need for such a product will not wane in the future, will not vanish in the future. And they have the ability to stay. They have the staying power. The staying power essentially means the resources to keep hanging there. So the financial resources, the working capital, and the where you talk to uh, stay there. If they have that, then they, they, they stay on. I'm sorry, I forgot to put my phone on silent. I'm sorry about that. So uh, which where each business would fall depends on the staying power. And as I said earlier, a majority of the businesses would fall under this middle category, which is wait and watch. Now, 
as I said, there are two kinds of businesses. Now, starting with, let's say, B2B. What is the biggest challenge or the change in the market scenario for a B2B? First is, thanks to this uh, COVID-19, the ways they were connecting to their customers have changed. Traditionally, this B2B marketing, if you were to look at the way B2B conducted their marketing efforts, would depend on trade fairs, uh, exhibitions, or in-person meetings, or you know gatherings. Uh, these were the uh, main forms of uh, connecting with their customers. But today, obviously, this is not going to work, thanks to the efforts of various governments in promoting social distancing and the scare of this pandemic. So the traditional methods are not going to work. And uh, obviously, I don't think there have been any trade fairs in the last six months or any exhibition in the last six months uh, uh, in any part of the world, for that matter. It's not just India, in any part of it. And China, for instance, traditionally has been a, a hub of all these trade fairs and exhibitions, and they are not there uh, connecting any of them anymore. So the traditional methods of connecting to their customers, which was trade fairs, exhibitions, uh, uh, in-person seminars, these were the ways they were connecting, but those have uh, changed. So now they have to think or they're forced to think of different channels of promoting their product. The well tried and tested channels are not going to work. So we need to think out of the box, think differently. How am I going to uh, let my customers know about my product in a B2B uh, scenario uh, where the number of customers are few, but each customer is important. That's a kind of B2B scenario, uh, fewer than a B2C uh, market condition. So they have to think of new channels of promotion. Second is in pricing. How do you stay in business? The change scenario, there is a even more pressure on manufacturers and producers of various products and services to be competitive with their pricing. One needs to be competitive at all times, but in the new normal, it's even more imperative, even more relevant, even more important that they modify their pricing to stay competitive. There has to be some kind of what you say, an empathy with the customers, which means that we know that everybody is going through a tough time. We know everybody is going through a bad time. We know there's a cash crunch. We know there's a financial funds crunch. So we want to be a uh, share a part of the burden and let me say, I will lower my price to some extent, or I'll be a little more con uh, competitive, I essentially just to stay in the business, but also to send a message across to your customer that, yes, I share your pain or I share your difficult times. I am with you. That is the message that has to be sent out during pricing. So B2B customer businesses, the change market scenario has got a very important message for them that it's now that they need to demonstrate their empathy to the, towards their customers by passing on the benefit of, let's say, uh, lower marketing costs or, or, or even for that matter, even lower employee costs, or if not anything else, at least to show that we care and that we want to be with you. So these are two essential changes that uh, I'll come to the changes in the way we connect. These are the essential changes that uh, B2B businesses will have to look at. I can tell you, I'm in the business of construction. I can tell you, uh, never before have I seen a voluntary drop in prices of concrete. Earlier, we had to negotiate, we had to bargain. Today, the scenario is such that the concrete manufacturers come and offer a discount on their own, saying, no, we know it's difficult today. Of course, it may have been, it may be their survival strategies. But then as a, a business buyer of their product or service, I feel that there is kind of a connect. Okay, we are going through a bad time, so you are trying to share our burden. So this change in pricing is something that I'm seeing daily in my business. I'm in a business where I meet these uh, manufacturers of products and services on a daily basis, and I can see there is a concerted attempt at lowering your pricing or becoming more competitive, if I want to use the jargon becoming more uh, competitive. This is something B2B customers have to realize. And what about the changes in the way you connect? Now that trade fairs are not there, now that exhibition is not there, how do you connect? So now it has got to be almost like a one-on-one -on -one connect. No way of getting there, getting everybody together at an exhibition or showing a product. It has got to be choosy one-on-one -on -one connect, which also means 
that there has to be a greater emphasis on data analytics. There's got to be a greater emphasis on making this one-on-one -on -one connects meaningful more than ever. Earlier, let's say you have a, a trade exhibition, 100,000 people, let's say walk in, or let's say even a business customer, about uh, 500 people walk in to your stall at a trade, a trade fair or an exhibition if you're a manufacturer or a producer of some a product. Out of that 500, maybe 10 would end up buying your product. That's a normal uh, feature, you know, the people would walk in, uh, go through all the stalls and come back to you, maybe 10 or 20 of them would come back and buy your product. And you were not really worried about the wasted exposure. Now you had put up a stall because those 20 were good enough. And the cost for connecting those 20 or 500 is still the same because you still had to put up a stall in a trade fair or an exhibition. So it didn't matter uh, how you're going to make it uh, relevant. But today, since those trade fairs are not there, those exhibitions are not there, you need to be able to find out who those 20 are who would come to you and maybe you'll end up contacting maybe 40, not 500, because you need to be one-on-one. -on -one. So this calls for a greater analysis of the data that you have, the, uh, the pre-marketing uh, work that you need to do before you actually contact a customer. So B2B has become very, very uh, focused, very, very uh, straight and uh, exactly contacting the relevant people. That is the kind of strategy that B2B in the new, the new normal will have to use. Now, when we talk about B2C, this is something that all of us are very, very familiar with. Uh, before we, I even go to the customers and the changes in their behaviors and the marketing tools required for them, let's understand what people were doing earlier so that we can uh, appreciate the changes that have happened post COVID. Earlier, uh, how would one, let's say, promote or uh, popularize a product? It could be hoardings or it could be uh, the newspapers advertisements, maybe even television ads. These were the most commonly used tools for uh, promoting one's uh, product. But are they relevant anymore? Nobody travels, everybody's at home, work from home number of people who are seen on the streets are much lower today, which means your hoardings are not going to be useful. And how many of them read the newspapers anymore? As it is, it was on the decline. The, the habit of reading newspapers has been on the decline and this pandemic has actually put an end to this altogether practically. And I can tell you, I used to buy at least about five newspapers uh, prior to this. Now I hardly read one. Uh, that's the kind of interest I have in reading the newspapers because you know, got used to different kinds of information gathering. So newspapers were, are not the tools that you look forward to, uh, look to. There's a change in the attitude and change in the needs, change in the uh, behavioral patterns. So the traditionally used marketing tools of hoardings, prints, television, etc., cetera, have to be thrown out of the window. You need to think out of the box. What are the things we can do? I'll come to. But prior to that, let's also understand that, again, some kind of empathy has to be uh, demonstrated. Uh, I can tell you something. Uh, I, I'm sure all of you must have been watching this IPL that's going on currently. And I saw an ad for Royal Challengers Bangalore. It was a very interesting ad. Uh, some of you may be able to recall this ad. It's about showing the concern for the frontline medical workers during this pandemic. They didn't say anything about uh, Royal Challengers Bangalore. They said, is we care for the frontline workers, we care for these uh, doctors and the paramedics, and this is our commitment, and we care and challenge accepted. This was the entire byline of this Royal Challenges Bangalore ad during this IPL, repeatedly shown. So I'm sure several of you would have seen. I saw another ad uh, during this IPL also. There was for a laminate. I don't remember the name. I don't want to, even if I remember, I don't want to say the name of the product. I'm not <laughs> advertising any product here. But a laminate where the USP they were promoting was viral kill. Uh, next time, if you have not noticed it, please look at it next time when you see a laminate advertisement during the cricket match. And you will see they are talking about viral kill. It means this laminate kills viruses. It's a laminate, uh, a plywood laminate, which you use for your furniture and uh, carpentry works. And the USP for that product is viral kill. It was another paint ad. ad. It said antiviral, of course, not to talk about soaps and toothpaste, etc. Yes, they are uh, very much on this uh, uh, virus track. It uh, you know, kills 99.9% .9 virus and 99.99% uh, .99 virus. 
if you see the almost all the products that are being promoted on a b2c platform for the end user for the customer suddenly the entire emphasis has changed what does it show are you really going to buy a laminate because it is viroctyl i i i mean i am not too sure i don't think uh, i'm going to fall for that uh, as much as they might want me to or this royal challenges bangalore retention for that matter what does it show why are they joining this bandwagon of uh, virokil antiviral antibacterial all kinds of medical terminologies in all kinds of unrelated products i can understand the medical terminology in a soap because okay there's hygiene and health involved in that uh, or even a toothpaste uh, or a sanitizer i can understand but then the kind of products which use this uh, slogan of antiviral and health and hygiene are totally unconnected unrelated to what you would normally expect uh, to see but what are they showing they are actually demonstrating an empathy and saying that we are aware of what your biggest concern is today today any social gathering or even a telephone conversation at least 50% of the conversation is about uh, the virus the health and uh, other preventive measures and how to boost your immunities i am sure you can uh, you, uh, you would you would have faced the same scenario same situation uh, yourself so these ads these promotion to these marketing techniques all demonstrate only one factor that we understand what is top of mind for you and we appreciate and we are with you so the way businesses have identified uh, try to identify themselves with the customer uh, that has been a feature all through uh, even for time immemorial every uh, uh, manufacturer every product wants to wants the customer to identify themselves with the product or the product to be identified with the customer but then how do you do that today has changed when you talk about the change market scenario the way people identify with the with the product is about this kind of empathy that is demonstrated that this, i know this is what you are thinking of so we are also thinking of the same so there is a kind of start trying to establish kind of a kind some kind of a connect so they remember this product and uh, would buy this product so things like the laminates paint soap sanitizer all all kinds of things i mean uh, everything even i saw an ad for a salon a hair cutting uh, facility everything is about this virus and the health and the sanitation and the health and hygiene that we are talking about so these are indirectly uh, trying to trying to tell the customer that we connect with your thoughts so you connect with our product this is the this is the trade off that they are trying to uh, push this is the concept that they are trying to push which is the new normal today the new normal is do you need to be really in the top of mind recall of your customers earlier uh, one where one we used to go to a store and buy after seeing an advertisement the celebrity endorsements let's say uh, Mahendra Singh Dhoni is talking about a product, or Virat Kohli talking about a product, or Amitabh Bachchan uh, talking about a product would have a lot of recall value and would probably influence your decision making in buying those products. Well, probably, or Deepika Padukone uh, uh, modeling for a product might make a, a difference. Today, people might still watch those ads, may still uh, remember the persons connected with the products, but. your purchase decision is not as influenced by those as it was earlier that is the new normal today i want trust to all of us to understand today the new normal is not about buying a product because of celebrity endorsement the patterns have changed the user behavior has changed the mindsets have changed what do they look for i'm sure uh, all the uh, students of this college would probably uh, agree with me today when i go online to buy a product what do i look for i don't bother about who had endorsed this i don't remember whether amitabh bachchan said uh, ask me to buy this or not i go for the user reviews in this how many people have given what kind of reviews online for this product and i go to amazon i see check the products i see there will be 10 products of identical nature what do i go for i look for the user reviews what is the feedback on these products and then buy the one that has got the best reviews this is the mindset of the user today what does it mean it means the customer endorsements is far more important than celebrity endorsement today because you have got the access to what the customers think which was not there earlier earlier you did not know what the earlier buyer of this product thought about this product there was not a very scientifically organized feedback mechanism 
today online this feedback mechanism is so prevalent so omnipresent that you would rather go by that feedback of an actual user of a product than a celebrity who may have never used the product for all we know because that is a business to endorse a product whether they use it or not so this has changed the way uh, companies market their products anymore uh, the kind of tools that they use to market the product in a b2c uh, scenario the, the, the change situation now as i said let's look at the types of customers now in the post covid situation i'm not talking about the customers earlier in a post covid situation roughly there are three kinds of customers uh, if you can uh, categorize the entire users of, of all products one set of customer is so much in panic today either because of uh, the low income or this pandemic has hit them financially very badly uh, badly affected by this uh, by this pandemic and their reaction would be stop buying anything let me just try and survive try to try and be alive i'm not going to do anything i'm going to hold on to whatever resources i have could because i maybe i've lost my job or maybe my business has closed down maybe uh, there are no customers for me or anyway even otherwise i was in a low income category uh, whatever that is a stop everything kind of a uh, customer is the first set the third set is the top 5% of the economy income segment who are comfortable and secure about their future they have they, they have no worries they feel they have enough stored away put away somewhere uh, comfortable and uh, secure about their future that may be the top 5% of the population the middle portion, portion is what interests all the businesses top 5% is of interest only to few select product groups uh, but the middle portion is something that uh, who are saying wait and watch i'm not going to stop everything i will still do something i'll still buy a few things i'll still indulge in a few things here and there but still not go overboard i'll hold on hold back on some of my purchases some of my purchase decisions i'll hold back on but they are uh, okay with the long term they feel they will come out of it in the long term but not so sure about the medium term today things are bad so i will hold on i will do minimum here and there but i'm fairly uh, okay about the long term so that is the kind of segment and as to be as is to be expected that constitutes a major chunk of our population who would still buy something still do some purchases but may not go overboard with the kind of expenditure and spending consumer spending that they do and most business would be targeting this segment if we understand their mindset it helps us in coming up with a marketing strategy that will reach this particular segment which is not sure a uh, little apprehensive about the immediate future but fairly okay about the long term so the again there has to be some kind of connect and empathy in the message and the marketing message that we give to this segment and this forms the majority of our population uh, you know almost a uh, indian population if you see in april uh, let me uh, tell you the numbers more than one third half a billion people were on the internet in april there was a survey conducted half a billion people were on uh, had internet connection in india that's a kind of numbers that we are talking about and that's where this uh, user endorsement becomes very relevant the internet is going to, and that's no secret that's no uh, rocket science to know that internet is going to play a very big role when even this uh, seminar that you are having now uh, i i don't think you have ever had a, a virtual seminar ever before and today everybody has taken to the technology in such a way that uh, you feel very comfortable you know you're almost like fish in water it's okay fine i'm happy with this virtual seminar kind of uh, approach and so is the case in marketing half a billion people uh, using the internet which means internet is going to play a role where the other forms of marketing which has been traditionally used may still continue to be there for some more time but i predict that uh, it's not going to last very long it is going to be a completely new normal new set of uh, methodologies new mechanisms by which you promote a product it's not about uh, the traditional methods anymore it's, it's changed irreversibly is what i feel so these are three type of customers sir. and it's important to know what kind of products will appeal to each of those customers now products i have purchased uh, taken the liberty to classify them in three broad categories uh, one of course essentials your basic food or water or survival or even medicines 
which cannot be postponed, which cannot be avoided, which has to be uh, spent, money has to be spent on. And all uh, kinds of customers, if you look at their customers, even the people who, uh, the first category of stopping everything will still buy those essentials. So if your business is in selling those essentials, then the entire population is of obviously your market segment. Uh, whereas the next two are the uh, differentiators in terms of your ability to sell your product. The minor uh, luxuries, let's say what kind of minor luxuries, even in this pandemic time, let's say the typical middle class Indian set aside basic food and medicines uh, for his survival. Set aside that, that obviously everybody will buy. Let's say uh, ordering in a meal, it's a luxury, but they are minor luxuries. Let's say you order online for a meal and uh, uh, what is it, Swiggy or Zomato will deliver at home and not cook at home. That's a minor luxury. Or let's say providing uh, online tuition classes for your child. That's a minor luxury. It's not essential. It's not necessary that one has to do it. But these people feel comfortable enough to spend those smaller amounts in things which may not be essentials, which may be considered a luxury, but would be considered a minor luxury. Or let's say even buy a few clothes during these times. Even though you may not, do, you may be working from home, okay, once in a while you buy some trousers or some dresses or whatever you want to buy, a few things here and there. These are minor luxuries and this becomes a big uh, factor for businesses because even though the spending may be low as a, a, let's say a producer would say, even though the ticket size may be low, the number of people spending are so large that becomes something that's significant enough for the uh, businesses to focus on these. Major luxuries, of course, uh, let's say addition to buy a car or a new phone or a new television or, or oh, <coughs> these are major luxuries, which if at all anything, it's only the top 5% uh, which would be interested in that. Others, the wait and watch will not go into these luxuries today. There are, of course, there are a few segments like um, hospitality, travel, tourism. They are completely off bounds right now. But those companies which are in those segments, which are completely off right now, let's like say hospitality and tourism and travel, amongst those companies, the ones which have the staying power will stay on and will bounce back in the days to come. That industry is not going to vanish. Maybe the number of players in the industry will reduce, the modalities will change, the methodology will change, the properties which people are interested may be uh, different, but that industry is not going to vanish. But there again, those who are able to survive and sustain uh, and hold on are the ones which will survive. So the major luxuries is a big, uh, those are major luxuries. It's not essential for your day-to-day -day living. It's not essential for survival. It's uh, in as Maslow's hierarchy goes, this is right at the top of the pyramid, almost close to the top. <coughs> but even without that, a major percentage of the population survive. But these minor luxuries, like which I in that I would also want to include uh, clothes or uh, or even minor, uh, smaller cosmetics, etc. These are things which will, people will still use. People, those who form the middle segment of the population, will still use, and because they are not going to stop everything, they will continue with a few of their indulgences, and maybe a reduced level of consumption, but consumption will still be there. So those industries which are in this segment of these kind of products. We'll still have a business. Only thing, the way to reach the customers have changed. The major luxuries, yes, they have to hold on and uh, wait for things to change. So, uh, given all these things, what is the way forward? One second. Given all these factors of understanding the customer, understanding the kind of businesses, understanding the products that we have, what is the way forward? What kind of changes that one has to uh, make in one's own strategy if you are in the field of marketing or you are a producer, a manufacturer, <coughs> or somebody who offers a service? The most important part in this is the data analytics. You need to be focused in your marketing efforts. Gone are the days of generally casting the net and hoping some fish will fall into that net. Gone are the days. Now today you Go to the ocean, find one fish and have a bait to catch only that fish. That is the kind of strategy that is required. Earlier days, 
general uh, businesses would cast a big net in the ocean and say, okay, some fish will definitely come in and I'll catch that. It doesn't matter how big my net is. It doesn't matter whether it's, uh, it's proportionate to the number of fish I catch. But today, data analytics is something that is going to play a very big role. So those of you who are in the field of data analytics, you've got it set. You've got it you're fully sorted for the future. This big data analysis is something that happens day in and day out. And every manufacturer, every provider of every service has to depend on that. I need to know who are my customers this is precisely, not general uh, population. I need to know okay, if so-and-so will buy. If Sunil D'Souza will buy this product, I need to know. And then I concentrate my attention only on his phone and only on his internet and try to be, get him attracted to my product. Mm -hmm. That is the kind of uh, the focus that is relevant in uh, today's scenario. And this all that can ha happen only if you, if you have the methodology and the systems to analyze the data. So it, this was in the offing, as I said, it's not totally new. But the pace at which these developments then happened is something that nobody had bargained for. Personally, if you had asked me, yes, these were, I, I knew that these were things that were going to happen, but I thought it'll take another three to four years for us to reach this level. But suddenly within a four months time, everything has collapsed into this uh, focus today. What I thought was going to happen in 2024 or 25 is happening today. The data analytics is going to be a big part in every single business that you take every single business. Uh, of course, technology is, has improved to such an extent that you can analyze the data and come back, come with some solutions. But then some of the costs of marketing is going to be in this. Earlier when a company used to prepare a marketing budget, there was not much of a allocation for data analysis. Today, every company is going to allocate budgetary uh, amounts to either do it themselves depending on the size of the company or at least buy the data for their use. So this is going to be a big factor in the way people market. So, and of course it goes without saying that uh, digital and online and social platforms are the ones that are going to uh, be relevant, more relevant. I would not say the only thing relevant, but they are going to play a very, very big role. Uh, I mentioned earlier about the customer reviews. I'm sure uh, so all of you look at the customer reviews. We'll also see how many people have bought this product. We'll also see if somebody has got given a bad review We'll also see whether the company has responded to the bad review. Are they bothered about the customer? So there are so many things that happen at an individual level. It's not a population, it's now individual. No more is, uh, is relevant that, okay, uh, you can, uh, Mysore, uh, we are able to sell so many tons of this product in Mysore. It is not relevant. Today, each customer has to be targeted individually. And we have the wherewithal, we have the technology, we have the tools to, attra uh, to focus on a customer. So the way forward, uh, friends, I feel is uh, more and more, of course, technology is going to play a very big role that goes without saying, but even within technology, the one that is going to be significant is our ability to analyze data, either ourselves or access analysis done by somebody else, which is relevant and focused to our product or service. So the way you market in post COVID scenario in the new normal, as I want to say, is about focusing your attention on specific customers, specific end users. And the way to promote is lo a lot more effort and cost are going to be on digital and online social media platform. This of course, this is uh, uh, not rocket science. It's, uh, everybody today will know that uh, uh, social media and online marketing tools are going to be the order of the day. But then, as I said, the change towards this has happened much faster at a much faster pace than what anybody would have ever anticipated. So to sum up, what, what does it all mean? Uh, let me sum up with a small uh, uh, story, a favorite story of mine. Let me sum it up with this. I tell all my employees the same story. Uh, I don't know how many of you watch cartoons and I'm, I'm an, a, a keen watcher of cartoons all my life. And uh, that still keeps the child in me alive. So even today, if wherever I can, I still watch cartoons. and. Uh, my favorite is uh, Tom and Jerry. Uh, I, I must have seen all the episodes of Tom and Jerry several times and I never get tired of that. Uh, in Tom and Jerry, if you notice, uh, Tom is a big, bulky, smart, smart cat. And Jerry is one small little chuha, small little rat. Uh, and every single episode of that, uh, Tom tries to catch Jerry and Jerry manages to escape. 
I found that little bit uh, illogical, if I may say so, uh, because Tom is a much bigger animal, bigger, uh, better endowed uh, animal, and why is he not able to catch this uh, small little rat? Uh, I said this is illogical. I mean, this sends a wrong message. So I was talking to somebody and. Uh, I expressed my apprehension. I said this, though it's funny to watch, but it's illogical. And in fact, I, in a very lighter way, I said, but they have kept it this way only so that the next episode can come. Because the moment Tom catches Jerry, the episodes are over. End of story. So just to make sure these episodes keep coming, uh, they ensure that uh, Jerry escapes. Then the person I was talking to, very, very knowledgeable, uh, intelligent man, uh, he said, uh, Vinky, uh, can I ask you some question? I said, sure. He said, what is Tom running after? I said, for his food. And what is Jerry running after? Running for? He said, for his life. That's the difference. If you think you're running for your life, you will win every single time. And if you think you're running only for your food, you're not going to win. So this is the uh, message that I got from Tom and Jerry, and that applies to our marketing, uh, all, the, all of us who are in the businesses, in marketing, etc. If you think what you do your life depends on that, you will succeed. You will find ways and means to adapt yourself to the post-COVID scenario. And if you think it's just only for your food, you may or may not succeed. So prepare yourself for the days ahead, COVID or no COVID, as we will still survive. Human race has survived centuries and we will still survive. All we need to do is change our approach, change our strategy. Good luck and this. Thank you. Hello, good evening, sir. I'm Sunil Leo. Uh, I'll go through questions if there are any questions from sure. the participants. Sure. Uh, thank you for a great session. It's a wonderful session. Uh, sir, yesterday we were uh, talking about climate change. That is a professor from Germany. He talked about uh, uh, the lockdown and its impact on climate change. So he said uh, uh, there is some changes it happened, but uh, it is not a, a long run. So he said whatever that we did for this uh, environment, it is like we have to take long, long years to uh, come back. So, is there such situation in market? I think no, I feel. <laughs> See, even in climate change, uh, I don't entirely agree with uh, what is being projected. If, let's say, three months of lockdown around the globe can bring about some change, which means the damage is not as irreversible as we think. Okay, it all requires is if three months of lockdown can bring back uh, certain changes that have been made in the climate, it's not uh, as irreversible. But in market, uh, when you ask about uh, uh, changes that have happened to the market, yes, there are changes. So you, we will never go back to the old scenario. We are never going to go back to the old normal. If you think that, okay, after six months, we are going to go back to wherever we were, that's not going to happen. This change, unlike a climate, this is almost an irreversible change that we are seeing today. Climate change can still be reversed, but here, what we are changing, witnessing in businesses, what we are witnessing in market is almost irreversible. People have got used to the new normal and they find this even more convenient, forcibly so. Nobody was prepared for this, but when this happened, people found these changes good in the, for themselves. You know, the amount of travel has reduced, the amount of unnecessary expenditure has reduced, the focus on health has improved, focus on building your immunity has improved, hygiene, sanitation, all these are positive changes. <clears throat> Nobody wants to go back to this pre-COVID times at all. So my, my take on that is... Uh, the changes that we see in markets are fairly irreversible because there is a fair deal of acceptance of this new normal. So this will stay the way it was. It will only improve from here on. It won't go back to where we were. That's my take. Oh, okay, great, sir. Sir, there is one more question from the participant. That is, uh, uh, how the situation for a startup business uh, during this period? I would say great, simply because the economies of scale really does not work today given the technology that is there. 
even the marketing tools which are available to even a smaller person, which was not there. Earlier, if you had advertised in, let's say, the first page of Times of India, you needed lakhs of it, lakhs of rupees to advertise. Today, to, adapt, uh, to reach the customers, you can go through a social media which is much more cost effective, much cheaper, much more affordable, which makes it easier, uh, which reduces the entry barriers. So considering that, I would feel the scenario, the environment and the ambience is fantastic for a startup. And uh, all you need is an idea today. You don't need funds. All you need is an idea. So it's ideally suited for startups. And I think they will do a great job in the years to come. Yes, 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 uh, excellent. So you told about uh, there is reduced uh, uh, travel, all those things. I read newspaper uh, uh, during this lockdown, uh, uh, when they started opening lockdown, uh, unlock one, two, three, in that time, uh, newspaper, they are saying that uh, there is demand for uh, uh, these uh, automotors, four wheelers, two wheelers, and uh, so how no. do you analyze this? In fact, the if you look at the data for automobiles, September 2020, everybody has sold more than September 2019, contrary to what uh, people think. So wh why does it happen? Just look look a little beyond the obvious numbers. Now, people are more and more inclined towards personal transport rather than public transport. Contrary to what was there earlier, earlier people are moving towards public transport saying we want to save environments, uh, reduce carbon emission, uh, all that. But after the pandemic, people don't want to travel in public transport. Those who can afford a two-wheeler want to buy a two-wheeler. Who can afford a four-wheeler want to buy a four-wheeler. And so it is all due to this change importance. Today, it is not about uh, the emission or even if I have to stretch a little more, let me be safe. Let me travel in my own vehicle and go forward. September 19, uh, automobile sales lower than September 20. So Marathi, if I remember right, has almost 25% increase in sales. In uh, compared to the same month last year, so more people are bothered about personalized transport, so they are buying those. Again, uh, I have a question on the same line, sir. So uh, maybe I study uh, went through some social media. I'm not uh, saying that it is the actual one. So uh, the people say that uh, in developed countries like in UK and all yeah. these pres even president they travel with uh, private uh, public transport. Yes. So if a uh, uh, country should develop, means you should use most of the public transport yes. only. Very, yeah. very true. See, uh, ultimately, uh, public transport is a more efficient use of resources. Let us put it that way. See, resources are common to all of us. Uh, resources are available for the entire population to use. And using a public transport is a more efficient use of the resources, and we should uh, go for it. But then the decision taken by an individual is based on his or her uh, understanding of the situation. As an individual, you will not take a public transport because it is going to save the climate. You will take a public transport if it is cheaper for you. You will take a public transport if it's Every individual takes a decision or uh, priorities, not based on common good. Common good comes much later. Individual good comes first. I mean, yes. That's a human tendency. Yes. So ultimately, the decision is based on uh, what you are comfortable with. Okay, sir. I think Vikram, sir, also here for his mm. next session. No, uh, sir, a... do you have any question for uh, Venkatesh, sir? You can ask. No, no, that won't, that won't be fair. I will be delightful lecture. I've been listening to it throughout and I enjoyed every moment of that. Thank you, okay. sir. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank, thank you, you. Venkatesh, sir, for your uh, time and uh, valuable session. Thank you very uh, much. Thank you we'll from see. the St. Philomena's College Management and all staff. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. Uh, Vikram, sir, shall we start your session or shall we give a buffering time? I think we should give a buffering time to the audience, right? <laughs> yeah. There is a, yeah, actually, schedule is 5.30. Shall we start 5.30? Is oh, our conversation okay, fine, live? Sir. Okay, fine. Now? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It is in line. Because I run a. So we can, we can. I run one yes, a, a organization called Manthan. Okay, okay, okay. Where uh, we regularly conduct uh, debates on matters of public interest. Okay, okay. Uh, we're doing it for fifteen years now, and we have just gone online. Okay, okay. And uh, so I'm used to this format now. Uh, me and my partner, we run this. And uh, just about last three days, we had a, our annual event called Mantan Sambhat. 
where every day we had debates for three hours each day for last three years. Okay, okay. So, so I, I can see the pressures on you as an organizer. And I'm, I think that you're doing a fantastic <laughs> job. So, thank you, thank you very much. <laughs> very good. Yeah. So, I mean, why I'm saying this is it's now 5.20, it makes sense to start on time, you will start on time, no problem. Okay. No, 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 it's okay, fine, sir. We'll uh, start, not a problem. We can start. Because, uh, we are given a YouTube YouTube uh, live stream, so not a problem for the participants. So uh, we will start, sir. We'll start with some formal introduction and all. Okay. No. <coughs> Good evening, participants. We are now having sec today's second session that is by um, M Mr. M. R. Vikram uh, on uh, FDI, Foreign Direct Investment in India. So uh, I request uh, Miss Irene, faculty from Department of uh, PG Commerce, to introduce uh, resource person. What what do you want? Thank you, sir. Pleasant day to you all. Mr. Vikram graduated as a BSc and LLB from Osmania University, qualified as a chartered accountant in May 1980. He is a gold medalist in mathematics and stood first in the university in Sanskrit during his graduate studies and a top rank holder in the century in the country in the chartered accountancy CA exam. Mr. Vikram joined his family firm of chartered accountants M. Anandam and Company in 1980. During the four decades of his work as a partner, he transformed the firm from a large tax advisory services firm to one of the leading audit and corporate advisory services firm in the country. He is an independent director in 15 companies, including Time and Facebook India. Mr. Vikram is a founder secretary trustee of MVF that is M. Venkata Rang Rangaya Foundation. It is also known internationally for its pioneering work fighting child labor and has mobilized more than a million children to schools. He is the founder trustee of Manthan, a leading discussion forum in India on issues of public interest, set up with the intention of nurturing an intellectual platform on matters of public interest. He is the chairman of REITs, which works on issues of livelihood skills and also the chairman of the Center for Collective Development, which works on farmer issues in Andhra Pradesh. Founder trustee of Project 511, which works with more than 1,000 schools in the twin cities of Hyderabad and Sakandrabad. He is a regular speaker on issues of economics, governance, and CSR. Nice to have you here, sir. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Irene. Thank you, Sunil, for the uh, introduction. Thank you, Irene, uh, for, for the generous introduction. Uh, and I thank uh, the Department of Commerce, St. Philomena's College, Mysore, for giving me this opportunity to speak to all of you. Uh, in normal times, I assume that you would have invited me to the college and it would have been a delight to be with a, with a college which is more than 84 years old. 1946, I can see that, that the year in which it was established. Uh, I've heard about this college. It's the most veneered college. It has a rich tradition of knowledge seeking. And, uh, and I'm sure that uh, everyone who has come out of the portals of your college is proud of its rich tradition and heritage. I also like your college's motto, Caritas in Scientia, love through knowledge. And I guess that I think what drives you in the last 84 years of your work 
is this simple message that love is a true knowledge. I must congratulate the vision of your founders for having chosen such an apt motto. I'll quickly then come to the topic given to me. In the next 30, 35 minutes, we can speak about it and I'll be glad to answer questions. Uh, I've asked to speak on FDI, Foreign Direct Investment in India, and speak on some issues of FDI. Uh, speaking on FDI is one of a very complex issues and involves centuries of uh, uh, debates, I would say, uh, and more so right from 1850 in India. Of The debate will largely center around international trade and commerce. There are also underlying issues in FDI of nationalism. I'll come to that a little later. But throughout, let us say, uh, in the last 200 years of FDI in India, we have always been very, very sensitive to dependence on outside forces of capital and technology. I must say that FDI itself is not new to India. It's not new to our, the whole globe. Uh, Sumerian merchants who traveled to Egypt 2,500 years ago found it more convenient to establish local guilds and manufacture products in Egypt to be used by the Egypt, Egyptians near the pyramids, though they were from Sumeria. Thousands of years later, a large number of companies from Britain set up shop in the United States in an early uh, reproduction of modern day FDI. India has been one kind of a victim of FDI when East India Company established its uh, outfit first in Calcutta and later spread outside the country and did a heft, rather hefty investment in local trade and commerce, but actually involved in a systematic loot of our country's resources. Why am I saying this now? I'm saying this because this is the dinosaur of the footprint of the dinosaur in our FDI thinking that we are out on a, after independence, we are out of this dependence we had. We are out of the loot we went through for 200 years. And also we are, we had the challenge to direct our own destiny. I must tell you an interesting point. From 1900 to 1950, India's GDP grew by less than 1%. If India's GDP was not growing in those 50 years, when India and China together were almost 50% of the world GDP just 200 years ago, 400 years ago, I correct myself, uh, 400 years ago, there is some message here which, is, which we, we can understand. The message is, that FDI, the investments into India, were into resources, mineral resources, raw materials, and the products generated out of this were re-exported back to India at huge prices. A case in point is the world of textiles. Indian cotton was as important as Egyptian cotton. India generated cotton. They did the vegetable dyeing in India. They were exported to the mills of Manchester. And from Manchester, it came back as finished cloth to buy at a high price. Thankfully, at the time of independence, this was all changed. And we now have seen almost about 74 years of independence and 74 years of stories of FDI in various forms. So I would say that one of the, the way to go about thinking about this FDI is this way. The first question I would ask is, what do we, who do we take this money from? Do, uh, most of us, even at a personal level, 
are sensitive when we borrow money from someone whom we know, more so from someone whom we do not know. It is the same thing at a national level. At a national level, we have to be sensitive to where the money is coming from. And why is he giving that money? Do we take money only if it comes from an ethical source? How do I care in this country if that money has come out of a money laundered source somewhere in Brazil or in China? And then, but it comes for a genuine investment in India. Or shouldn't I be asking that question that no, I want money, I want investment, but I want to know who is investing and what kind of a person is investing. Because if I know that, then I also know what this investment will do in this country. Here, I would refer to this global phenomenon of tax havens. One of India's largest investors is from Mauritius. Largest FDI investors is from Mauritius. And we all know that Mauritius is a very small island which is not capable of investing so much money on its own. This is global money being routed through Mauritius into India. It is being done because Mauritius offers a very healthy tax regime of very low tax on dividends and capital. But do I know who is investing into these Mauritius companies? Is it transparent? Can we take the chance? This is why these questions need to be asked more so today when monies are coming in for a variety of reasons which are not entirely uh, subject to nationalism. The second question I would ask is, what do we take it for? What do you take money for? Do I take it for all sectors? Do I say, or do I say some sectors are for domestic consumption or domestic investment, I'm sorry, domestic investment. Some sectors, should, I do not want foreigners to be involved in it. I don't want them to own my agricultural lands. I'll come to that again a little later. I'm very sensitive to uh, someone funding a, a cigarette company, let us say. I, I don't want that. So there are some issues in which this nation stands upon, on its ethical values, on its moral values. And when it stands upon those values, then I don't want FDI to counter those values, even if it is a profitable venture. If I permit tobacco investments in India, then I'm sure that the investor will promote local employment, will promote, I mean, they, uh, uh, will actively generate profits, maybe pay taxes in this country and repatriate a portion to outside India. But do I want it? Do I want my citizens to have a, a habit like that? These are questions which we, which the debates go on continuously in the parliament. The other question, I mean, is when I say, what do we take it for? Is that this closing of the financial borders. Closing of physical borders is okay. I have a border. Of course, it is under test right now between India and China, but still I have a border. And I, I know of methods of closing this financial, of this physical borders. But how do I close my financial borders? How do I make sure that my financial borders are not open for miscreants, are not open for money laundered money? And when I ask this question, it becomes more and more difficult in a globally connected world. More than a trillion transactions happen every day in the global capital flow. Nobody can really control it. Because nobody can control it, maybe we will have a fresh view and not ask these questions. This is a question I'm posing to each one of you looking, listening to this debate. If technology superior, so superior, that I should not be asking these questions, that I, because I cannot prevent the flow of technology. The other question we should need to ask is, when does India take FDI? Do, do, after all, all of us know 
that at the time of independence, India was a capital starved nation. We just did not have money. When we did not have money, what did we do? We followed the path of building a socialist India with an active involve of the involvement of the government. And the government invested in heavy industry, invested in steel plants, invested in dams, invested in a variety of infrastructure projects. And these infrastructure projects were not capable of absorbing, of, they were beyond the reach of many, many private sector investors. So what did India do? India borrowed technology, the Bilai steel plant, the Borkaro steel plant, the Rutkela Rut steel plant, had people from Russia, from, from Czechoslovakia, working in India. But we must remember that they limited the input to technology inputs. They said those people can work in India, but they did not accept their investment into India at that point in time. But then, if I say that, who are the people who had already invested in India at that time? That makes a very interesting story and I'll give you one example. Hindustan Lever is one of India's oldest companies. Hindustan Lever was actually formed out of a merger of three companies of Lever Brothers, United Traders, and I forget the third name, in 1935. When the first carton of sunlight soap arrived in India, then in, in Calcutta, people were curious, where is the soap coming from? Why are they distributing the soap in India? And Indusan Lever slowly started establishing <coughs> a manufacturing base in India. They started distributing it to India. And by 1956, Indusan Lever became a very important manufacturing unit in fast moving consumer goods as it is called now. But is Hindustan Liver an Indian company or is it a multinational company? Is there foreign direct investment into when there is FDI into India through levers? Then do we take it as an Indian company? Because if they have been in India for 70 years, for 80 years, 90 years. Some of you may not know one of the most popular early products of Hindustan Liver was Dalda. And Dalda was a 70, 70 years ago, it was a household product. It has now vanished because of a different reason altogether. And now, levers is in every aspect of our life. When it is there for 80 years, how long do we say that it is not an Indian company? But do we still say no? Because 60 to 65% is held by lever brothers outside India. It is not it, an Indian company, but it's a company outside India. There's another interesting aspect on FDI. FDI means the flow of capital from a foreign enterprise into the Indian borders. Now, many companies make profits in India, let's say, and they do not repatriate these profits to outside India. They retain this profit in India. In, in one sense, actually, the retention of profits into India is also FDI. I would ad advise each one of you to go to the balance sheet of Hindustan Lever. I don't want to give the figures. Go to the balance sheet of Hindustan Lever and see what is the share capital and what are the retained earnings. And just see the distance between these two. That is the kind of investment they have continued to make in India. It is in this context we have to think, is FDI only foreign equity flow, but it, is it also retained earnings in India? The next question I would say is, why do we accept FDI? Well, like I told you, there's a huge shortage, there was a huge shortage of capital in when India became independent and uh, slowly, India opened its financial borders and permitted investment in consumer goods. Coca-Cola is one of the early entrants into India. So was Brook Bond, so was Lipton. And they were all later amalgamated. These two companies later amalgamated into Hindustan Livers. There used to be a famous talcum protocol called Ponds. All these companies 
were steadily growing in the Indian borders through FDR. In 1973, because of the forex crisis we were going through at that point in time, India decided to shut its foreign, foreign exchange borders in by limiting these foreign investments into India. They said that not more than 40% of the equity of the company can, buy, can be held by foreign companies. That was a crippling blow on the flow of investment into India. One of the companies that was seriously affected by this blow was IBM. IBM came into India in 1951 on the invitation of Jawaharlal Nehru. And since 51 till 74, IBM was working with every government department. Now the senior side of the story. IBM used to charge exorbitant rates to these government departments for their use of IBM's mainframe computers or whatever services they were offering. Now, how do we say that IBM was not a new East India company? How do we say that they were not exploiting and looting? So these debates went on in the parliament and the 40% rule was strictly enforced and Hindustan Lever, IBM, made representations to the government of India saying, please relax this because we want 51% control. In 1977, the, the Janata government came. George Fernandez, who was the then industries minister, made a famous statement. I would allow Coca-Cola to come into India, but then they should share their secret formula of Coca-Cola to us. Now, Coca-Cola would not, has not shared the secret formula to anybody anywhere in the world. Rumor has it that that formula is in some vault in Atlanta, but we don't know about it. But Coca-Cola refused. When Coca-Cola refused, IBM also followed the path. Someone went to George Fernandez from IBM and asked him, told him, you see, we had a similar demand from Charles de Gaulle in France. We refused to budge, and Charles de Gaulle permitted our investment in France. George Fernandez said, well, that is France. This is India. If you don't like my rule, you can get out. That, I think, was a watershed day. The fortunate byproduct, which was not a quality product, but the fortunate byproduct of removing Coca-Cola in India was another drink, which in India started at that time. It was called Double Seven. Some of the older people in this audience will know that it is a bad cola drink. But government of India promoted double seven. In the early 80s, Mrs. Gandhi, when she came back to power, started revisiting the FERA norms of 40%. The Foreign Exchange Regulation Act of 40% was started, they started looking at it. And then they said, we will not get the latest technology unless we allow the latest technology com companies to come into India freely without fetters. So one of the things they started doing was to allow the telecom sector into India. Throughout the 80s, many telecom companies around the world started investing in India and started, uh, I mean, it, it was a liberalization of the, of the sector would mean that many modern products came into India. Simultaneous to that, India started importing pretty heavily and its exports were as weak as ever. When it is so, by 1991, and all of us know that 1991 is a watershed year in the Indian economic history. By 1991, we were close to bankruptcy. Actually, we had no choice, but it is still the sagacity of the then Prime Minister Mahathir Nasimara and the Finance Minister Manmohan Singh to have said that gracefully we should say that what India needs now is foreign direct investment without fetters into manufacturing, without limits into services. And if anybody has to say, when did FDI start in India? I would say that formally, it started in 1991. And in 1991, when we started liberalizing 
and we dismantled the industrial licensing empire, money started flowing into it. Since then, in the last 30 years, we have witnessed a variety of policy changes into India. Uh, into, into FDI, sorry. These variety of policy changes are all rooted to make sure that we, we get quality capital from people who are likely to stay and invest in this country. There is one interesting thing of FDI, which is not there in portfolio flows. When a foreign investment gets into India in the form of equity and gets into the company, that company quickly invests in various assets which are rooted in this country. The money which comes from outside India in the form of capital is converted into land, building, plant and machinery rooted and affixed into our geography. That is the quality of FDI. If it is a portfolio flow, as it is called foreign portfolio flow, then these, these monies won't be converted to land building plant and machinery and other assets. It won't be converted into training people and into getting a skilled workforce. It will be invested in the financial markets and take advantage of the volatility of the financial markets to make money for the portfolio investor. FDI is different. FDI roots itself into it. Once it roots itself into India, a new challenge comes. This is for the investor. The investor knows that he can invest into this country that is converted into a machine somewhere sitting in one industrial estate. And tomorrow the government says that he can't take it away. This is the risk he's taking. That when he invests in FDI, he invests in the stability of the government. So why do why should countries have uh, what shall I say need long term FDI policies? They need long term FDI policies to offer a transparent regime to make investors comfortable that the rules of the game won't change very often. Remember, in in manufacturing more than any other place. Investments take time to mature. A lot of mistakes are made before they can click on the right product, on the right process, to the right delivery in the right market. To earn those returns on those capital, it takes time. And while it takes time, if we keep changing the rules, then you are giving a wrong signal to the investor. Stability is one of the primary things the FDI investor looks when he gets into a country. Suppose I say, and this is a question to all of you, and you can think about it. Suppose I, I give uh, 100 crores to one of you and say that you can invest in Argentina. Uh, that person I know is giving you a 16% return. But you can also invest in the United States. And he's saying that he'll give a 2% return. All of us know, simple arithmetic, that 16% is eight times time of 2%. But still, we know that US today is the largest recipient of FDI even today. So why do people go to US in, in though, they, though their bond market gives such a low number? Because of the guarantee they give that they are stable. And that's a very important thing in the FDI environment. It's a very important thing that people should know that the environment is stable, predictable, and it is something which they can work with without having to fear or favor. All this some time ago was partly disturbed when in a famous case of Vodafone, India levied tax for transfer of shares outside India. This became a debatable point because the transaction was totally outside India and the tax was levied in India and it needed intervention partly from the Supreme Court, partly from the government of India, partly from the industry for the Vodafone case to reach where it is now. I'm saying this only in the context that FDI is not just FDI. FDI needs stability in trade policy. It needs comfortable labor laws. It needs understanding a legal environment. It needs 
rules of corporate governance. It needs predictable and trusting tax laws. The, it is in this context that we should look at one or two sectors and see how it works. I told you that telecom sector had a boom. They had a boom in 1990s as government slowly started withdrawing in telecom. And remember, till that time, BSNL, as it is thought of now, in those days it was called Department of Telecommunications, was one of the last, was the sole producer of uh, infrastructure network in, in the telecom industry. Even there, even now, they are there. But look at what happened in FDI when global players started coming into India. Our air terms, our idea, are all products of global investment into India. When the mobile phone was first became active, it is it was 16 rupees a minute. Today, Reliance Geo offers it free in some some kind of a plan, not not entirely, but some kind of a plan. So FDI permits a reduction of price and the consumer is benefited out of this. Now, many, many questions follow when we say that the consumer benefits. Then are we, one of the chief questions would be then, shouldn't I be allowed to buy a Chinese phone, which is cheap, it's only 10,000 rupees. So I mean, I, I can't think of a brand, but I, I would guess Oppo or Rex, Redmi or whatever they are. Xiaomi or whatever they went for. Frankly, I think all three are the same company, but different brands. But shouldn't I be allowed to buy them? And why do I care whether some Chinese company is making profit? Because I'm getting a cheap phone on a smartphone, as smart as any, any other phone anywhere in the world. And why should I buy a Japanese phone or a German phone? I wouldn't want it. Nokia is dead on its phone, not because they had a poor phone, but because they couldn't compete with the Chinese. And the Chinese were investing in India to deepen Indian's ma Indian market to sell their phones. So here the question, here is the question. The question is, shouldn't the FDI policy permit an environment where the customer benefits. After all, we are all in this market. So for the customer, and if the customer is getting a cheaper product, then shouldn't the FDA environment ensure that that environment continues? There is an opposite question to this. And that question is stark now in COVID times. All of us know that India changed its policy in the last two months, and this is an outcome of a trade war between USA and China, which has been going on the Trump administration for the past three years. What is the change which India made in the last two months? They said that prior to this statement, the investment in India in the automatic route means that they don't need any government permission. But now India has changed saying that where the investment comes from neighboring countries which share a land border with India, then that investment needs prior government approval. Is it a step backward? Are we saying that we are afraid of these things? There's another collateral incident which happened, which scared the Indian market. The Chinese Central Bank invested more than 1% of its investment of the share capital in HDFC. We all know and we are proud of this national institution, which HDFC is. So suddenly, when China started investing in HDFC, the Chinese Central Bank, we panicked. They yeah, all they invested only 1%. But when they invested that 1%, and now it became public, because any person who invests more than a percentage, if his investment is disclosed, then they said, is China taking over India? Is slowly our Chinese company, it's only 1%. Why should we be scared? But then it is 1%, we should be scared. Because if it is 1% today, it will be 10% tomorrow. China is capable of that kind of investment. 
So the FDA policy, is it a reaction or is it a strong, uh, what shall I say? Uh, I mean, yes. we, we can, can we change the policies as a reaction or shouldn't we be scared at all? It is here that I would refer to why China continues to get the kind of investments they are getting in the world today. We all know about China. It's a communist regime. There is no free speech. Human rights are not protected. There are opaque regulatory institutions. Chinese judiciary systems are just not reliable. Given this, there should not be a single rupee, a single dollar of FDI. China is a, one of the largest destinations of FDI in the world. Isn't this a contradiction here? I started this lecture saying that we want ethical investors. We want to know who's giving us money. We want it to be kind to our citizens. We want our customers to benefit. And we, all these things are proved wrong in China. But still, China offers one of the biggest destinations of the global investors. How do I explain this contradiction? I explain this contradiction with, what? with a simple statement I would make, that the global investor is greedy. He's a greedy investor looking for returns on his investment. What he's looking for is financial returns on his investment, not the quality of the production there. China, in one sense, by having lax pollution laws, let us say in a steel plant, is in one way exporting pollution to other countries. Because when you buy a Chinese steel product, you are buying low quality pollution I and mean, high quality pollution into the product. You are allowing that to happen. So when the non-transparent system permitted a spread of COVID and China never revealed that, then I would only say that the globe has finally realized that a greedy investor is not the end all. But I have not answered this question satisfactorily. Why do people still go to China? Even today, Chinese investments are post-COVID. FDI is once again going up. Because they offer something which, which every country of that nature should offer. They offer a deep and a wide market. They offer excellent infrastructure. Every person who goes into China is impressed by the infrastructure in China. Every person thinks about those buildings, those, those roads, those dams, those ports of, a, of, of unimaginable size. So when these things are done, then when you're providing the infrastructure for it, then the investor knows that he is being respected for the money which he gets in. Consequently, he does not care if the citizens are not treated properly for free speech. If, they, if he does not care if they don't have the liberty to say whatever they say. He doesn't care if there are human rights violations. So now the next question I would ask each one of you is, the question we have to answer to ourselves is, is it fair? Is it right for our country to accept such investment and to compromise on these things? The worker conditions in China and the work ethic is very, very high. There are expert skilled force. And I am always impressed by a statement which Tim Cook, the chief executive of Apple made. He said, if I want chip designers in United States, of top quality, I will get 100 to 150 of them in this auditory. In China, I can fill a football field. What does it mean? The country has invested in a skilled man force of a high quality. The country has invested in education, has invested in knowledge, and that made it possible for it to be a leading manufacturing destination in the world. And why am I talking so much about China when we are supposed to be talking about FDI in India? I am talking about China because there are some things which we can learn from the Chinese experiment. 
And I would say, these are the things we should be learning from Chinese experiment. One, to invest in skills. FDI must be freely permitted, which it is in fact, but, but we actively promote it for skill development. FDI, which has now happened in this budget, must be permitted for foreign universities to be established in India. FDI must be permitted for Indians to be invested outside India and coming back on a returning Indian scheme, like how the Chinese have. These are the sources of capital which strengthen the nation, which China did right. We should think of economies of scale. I'm sure each one of you is following what Apple is going to do in India. They're going to invest $140 billion in India to make an iPhone. And Apple phone is not made by one person. It made by almost seven or eight companies that are going to invest in India. That's the kind of scale because this is the kind of market there is not only in India, but we have to address the global market. FDI in India must be much bolder because we must have confidence in ourselves that in case we, there are unethical investments, we'll have the courage to ask them to go back. There are, of course, I should say, uh, some areas where FDI has to be uh, in track with many other laws which are going simultaneously. I think I'll finish another five, seven minutes. Yeah. What are the other laws which FDI must track you to, for, it to make, for, for India to be making it a destination? One of them are free labor laws. Labor laws in India are known to be uh, unfriendly to the investor. Now, whether that's the right thing or the wrong thing is a matter of debate. To have protection of labor laws, to make sure that people cannot be hired and fired easily. But the other way to look at it is, why will I go to a country when, when I'm making losses, I cannot change my business model. I need the power to fire. It is a, these are questions which don't have definite answers, but these are stands which need to be taken. Till about four years ago, India did not have a stable bankruptcy law. We have just started the insolvency and bankruptcy court till about not four years ago, about six years ago. And now we are just making it work. There are pitfalls, there are many challenges, but the code is essential that when there is failure, we recognize failure without stigma. That is essential for the FDI to come to India. The next thing we should offer to the FDI investor is a stable macro environment. Our fiscal deficit must be in control. Our foreign exchange rates, the rupee dollar, rupee pound, must not be volatile. We all know that there is a steady deterioration of the rupee, which I mean, let's say the dollar. Over, if you see over a period of time, the average rate will be to six to seven percent. But if that is so, it is fine. Much better if there is no volatility, but that's not possible. That has complex, equations linked with inflation, our own fiscal deficit, our own economic environment, global environment. But what China has done successfully is to peg its export rate, yuan rate. This gives a confidence and India must be able to do the same. There are two more things which an FDI investor would look for among others. One is a quick resolution of disputes and efficient courts. Our judicial system is horrible to say the least. I wouldn't, if I'm a global investor, I wouldn't negotiate an agreement with an Indian, with an Indian company if I'm not confident that when I have a difference of opinion, that matter is not going to be resolved at the earliest. Because if matters are not resolved at the earliest, capital is being wasted there. So I wouldn't do that. One place where India lags behind is the our dispute resolution mechanism and our courts are notoriously slow. The second 
place which I would say that we are we are lagging behind is a stable tax regime. Our tax laws are definitely not stable. We say one thing one day, we say another thing another day. That is not what the global investor wants. He wants stability, predictability, even if it is a high tax rate. We seem to be thinking that lowering the tax rate will solve the problem. It is not lowering the tax rate alone. What needs to be done is to make sure that the investor is confident that the tax rate will not change for the next 5, 10 years, 15 years. That is when he can do his calculation right. All these things, if they are simultaneously done, we are creating an environment. I wouldn't, in this lecture, tell you about a variety of things and variety of uh, sectors of the FDI policy. I think that's a waste of time. All I would say is, uh, in, the, in the absence of time, and I would be glad to answer questions, is the issues in FDI, I will close. The issue in FDI is that in what the investor would look for is an efficient bureaucracy, a low political risk, a confident security environment, a significant cost advantage, uh, an infrastructure which he can rely on with quick turnaround, and two more things. Ownership of data. Our previous speaker was talking about it and it occurred to me that maybe the future investor wants a confidence that his data in this country will be protected and not stolen. That's a new aspect of this kind of investment. And lastly, protection of his IPR. The global pharma industry, the global software industry want reliable mechanisms to protect the intellectual property rights. These are some of the issues which I thought that I will refer to today. I think India, it is a, I'm told that there is a word in Chinese for crisis. As all of you know, Chinese is a pictorial language and the word for crisis and the word for opportunity is the same. Those pictures are the same depending on the context. Fortunately for us, we are in a global crisis. Fortunately for us, we can think of it as we are in a global opportunity. The time has come for India to tweak its FDI policies, to be consistent with what the investor wants, to, be, to meet the challenges of the lack of people who want to be employed and who want the, uh, who want to lead, lead a better life, better standard of living. And to get into the place where China is, we are far away from that. But if nothing is ever achieved by a reasonable man, we can't be very, very reasonable for achievement. This is a, not an original, this is from Winston Churchill, who was one of the most unreasonable men you could think of. So I would say that India must be in the forefront to change its policies, to be to take advantage of the present crisis and to make all these changes simultaneously and to go to the global investor with confidence, with the courage and confidence for them to take risks on our markets and our nation. Thank you. And I'll be glad to answer questions on this. Uh, thank you, sir, for your uh, wonderful session. Uh, actually, when we speak about FDI, generally we start from 1991. Okay, but uh, you made a different uh, 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 the introduction for FDI, so that is uh, new for us. Uh, thank you for that wonderful session. We have a few questions from our uh, participants. Uh, that is, uh, one is, in what way COVID-19 pandemic has affected uh, international commerce? I think the person asking the question knows the answer. <laughs> okay. So it is a general question it is asked. Uh, no, no, I'm just <laughs> the, 
I would think that the COVID-19 pandemic has affected international commerce in three ways. First, uh, of course, international global trade and commerce have sort of shrunk in the last five months. I hope it is temporary, and I guess it will be temporary. That's the first thing. The second thing is people are looking at newer ways to do trade and commerce. So there is a disruption in the market. And I think that we have to respect that those disruptive processes. What is happening is, like, like what we're doing right now, I'm sitting in Hyderabad and talking to you, right? We have, we have changed the business model, though I would love to come there and talk to you. We have changed the business model. And we have said that this is one way of doing business, of spreading knowledge, right? So I think international commerce has changed in a way in some sectors, but definitely not in manufacturing. In manufacturing, you still need to have a person, a machine, a product, a delivery, a process, a delivery to home. That won't come by magic by working from home, right? So some industries have been affected. Many industries, many industries have definitely not been affected. The last thing I would say what international commerce, the COVID-19 has done, it has redrawn political equations. And I think, I think we have to note that at some level, that even before COVID-19, political equations were subtly changed between China, between India, between Europe, between... But this has exacerbated the situation. And I think we have to be alert to it that we will be seeing in the next three, five years, new alliances being formed. Bilateral trade of new, new kind of trade agreements will be there. And it will be an exciting journey for all of us. Thank you, sir, for your answer. There is one more question. How to navigate market crash in, the, in this COVID-19 situation? Which market has crashed? Definitely not the stock market. Not, uh, yeah. It is charged, it is, is crossed 40,000 the other day or even yesterday. Actually, market given opportunity for the investors during lockdown, I think. <laughs> it is strange. But then, <laughs> uh, even today, the Reserve Bank of India has said that our market will shrink by more nearly 9.5%. So, how do you navigate crash is a very interesting question. At a personal level, if it is possible, I would say reduce debt at all costs. If you want good navigation, it is better to stay away from investments and to, to reduce debt. That will be the first step you would take to have uh, discipline in your cash flows. Because as I see it, there is irrational exuberance in the market, as Alan Greenspan would say. The stock market is not the index. Rural markets are in distress. And food inflation is being kept low, but it's going to provide challenges in future. So the first step would be to reduce debt. The second thing is to retain skills. And it's very, very important that it's not going to be easy. That many companies, many corporates, many small businesses have to somehow wait it out for another year and they have to find their own business models of waiting it out. I won't pay you 10,000 rupees salary, I'll pay you 6,000 rupees, but next year I'll pay you 12,000 rupees. Some new models have to come up and I think that that is very necessary because mm. it's cash flows are under stress. The third way to navigate this crisis is to innovate. We still need food, clothing, and I think that delivery models, people can innovate. Innovation is there at every street corner we can see. So we have to constantly think of how we can deliver the same product at a cheaper price or a better product at the same price. Innovation must be the core of navigation. Uh, Sunil, can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. Yes, yes, sir. You can go through. 
uh uh thank you uh, ca vikram for i think the presentation was really wonderful every word that you spoke was worth listening to yes. sir i have got two questions related one is uh, on the basis of uh, you know what you said that uh, companies i mean to say FD, fdis are not looking at uh, you know the tax rate yeah that is what you mentioned yeah so on the basis of that my question is don't you think india missed out on an opportunity uh for attracting companies which were manufacturing in china you know when they moved out of china because of this covid situation that is one question sir and yeah. second question is uh, uh pertaining to our vodafone case yeah uh, uh do you think that uh, our late finance minister and late president uh, shri pranam mukherjee made a mistake by going in for what i should say a retrospective change in law just because the government lost uh, you know its case and though the company has won today don't you think that was a retrograde step when it comes to attracting fdi in india those are the two questions i have to answer your first question i think that india has still not lost the opportunity uh, but uh, they can still get back a portion of the opportunity to india uh, it is not that everyone is running away from china and rushing to india uh there there will be realignment but india is just not ready it's not ready not just by tweaking laws uh i'll give an example uh the example which i mentioned in my speech iphone is going to be manufactured in india but iphone needs 20000 engineers skilled of a certain variety do are we ready and it is not enough if we have 20000 engineers we need 40000 engineers because if one of the engineers is not there in the in the system he needs a replacement that ratio should be 1 is to 2 1 is to 3 1 is to 4 if you notice all pharmaceutical industries will be in one block in hyderabad all textile units will be in tirupur all software industries will be in gurugram you know what is happening there that there is an ecosystem of skilled people in that location china offers that ecosystem if india wants to take the place of china i think that they should start investing even now even if we take 5 7 years we should have done it 5 7 years ago 10 years ago we have all, everyone has been saying it but nothing much is done but skills must be the core for investments to shift because the investor is watching it so i do not expect that this to happen dramatically but i still don't think that we have missed the bus to okay sir to answer your second question uh regarding fdi i think it is a gross error on uh, on the retrospective legislation of vodafone uh for i'm sure uh, someone like pranav mukherjee had his own reasons but i would think that he belonged to the old school saying that people must not take advantage of flaws in taxation laws and uh, they must respect national sovereignty that my money should come to me and i think that's a in hindsight with a that's a very narrow view of how you raise investor interest in this country had you not done that retrospective legislation and respected the supreme court order then that would have given a better signal to the globe that oh, we are a reliable nation i think it was an error okay thank you thank you sir thank you very much thank you oh thank you sir for your answer thank you manas sir for your question uh, sir one more uh, question that is uh, 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 my point that is uh, i my opinion yeah uh, you talked about uh, skilled employees and laborers in china yeah so uh, how can we uh, bring that situation in india and uh, i also g- take it further whether our new education policy will uh, help in that se- sense uh it uh, dr sunil this is a very very deep question and uh, this will take at least 3 hours of my time i will try and answer it in 3 minutes fine see investments 
should be made first in primary education and uh, the person the entity to make this investment is the government of india our investment must be such that this country is 100% literate in a defined period of time i would make this hazard to make this statement no nation has become a, has become a developed nation when its people are not literate every developed nation has very high literary literacy rates so the first question to answer is are we in is investing enough in elementary education and government must take entirely responsibility because they are the single biggest deliverer of education at that level the second thing i would say that india must have an evolved higher education plan many people complain and i don't agree with them that you know india has uh, produced engineers from iits iims and they all go outside india and they don't work for this nation but aren't we proud that sundar pichai is in charge of google aren't we proud that satya nadella is in microsoft what is it? and at some day when when this happens we are also saying at the same time that satya nadella or sundar pichai will maybe reinvest in india which they are doing they, they, they have not given money to reliance they are putting money back to india so somewhere that national consciousness even though they are us citizens it will be working india must have a bold higher education plan many of you may know may not know china has every year sends nearly 25000 scholars to do phds outside china and expects them actually binds them but frankly expects them to come back china funds them can we be so bold do we have such schemes this is a third thing our idea of research itself is flawed the the, the peer reviewed paper papers now us is followed by china but india is far far behind because if you see some of the statements the some the, not just this government the previous government also made it saying that we should be a uh, result oriented research how can you have result oriented research the idea of research is failure not success so how can you have result oriented research how can you and i share an idea and i should be able to work on the idea and then discover that my idea was wrong if thousand people discover and there is an ecosystem of wrong discovered then one fellow will succeed but the government's attitude and the environment here is that we want a result oriented science and technology that is wrong the other thing in the i would say and i would uh, is on the education policy is that i mean i would comment the education policy is that we must have a, a larger investment in humanities some of we think that only engineering sciences and medical sciences are the only sciences to learn no i think doing ba in english is as good as ba in physics bsc in physics but this country by not pursuing humanities we producing robots we have a flawed uh, higher education policy art language are things to celebrate culture are things to celebrate and celebration is part of our life we don't do enough on that count i can go on and on but i i, I can say i'm i'm rambling so i want to stop here but uh, uh, we have new education policy which says we should focus uh, focus more on skill oriented uh, uh, syllabus absolutely right but then it's, it's, it's not enough of skill i need to be english i need to be yes. a history what's yes. wrong 
BSI college. What's wrong? Yes. Uh, I'm able to speak to you because I've been trained in this language. Yeah. Right? Yes. Yes. And uh, uh, I'm assuming that what I'm saying you understand. Right? How can that happen without a formal educa English education training language? This is part of the system. We don't need just engineers. We need everyone. Yeah. So that is why I'm saying that this concentration on skills and development is good, but that is not the only thing. That's a limited point, I mean. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you for your uh, wonderful session and uh, uh, great uh, uh, answer for different questions. Uh, yeah. Thank. I thank from the side of management, Saint Philomena's College, for your valuable time and uh, uh, great presentation on FDI in India as well as you compared with uh, China how they are doing dealing with this. Thank you very much. Sir. Thank you. Uh, dear. Dear participants, now I call upon uh, Ms. Irene, uh, Faculty Department of PG Studies in Commerce to uh, brief about today's uh, session. Thank you, sir. Hi, once again. Okay, so the first session we had was on the post-COVID-19 market scenario in India. It was by Mr. A.S. Venkatesh, who enlightened us on the significant changes that is continuously occurring in the present market space. He also cited real relevant examples with regard to advertisements connecting to the present COVID situation. He also pointed out a relevant observation that we have already accepted the new normal scenario, even with regard to commercial aspects in marketing. In the second session, we had Mr. M. R. Vikram, who spoke on the issues of foreign direct investments in India, especially during the time of pandemic, FDI in, in Indian market was assumed to be dwindling, yet it has latent potential to revive and resolve the present economic issues in India. He emphasized on what the global investor would actually look for. Uh, he also stressed on a quick resolution of disputes, which actually has to be implemented because a global investor will not want to negotiate while having difference of opinion. He also stressed that our country needs to have a stable tax regime and other factors also to gain the confidence of the investors across the globe. So keeping these points in mind, we end today's sessions. Thank you all once again for your active participation. We will meet with other issues relating to employee branding and public and private sectors in India tomorrow. I request all the participants to kindly fill the feedback form posted in your YouTube chat. Thank you all.